So my name is Gavin Tweedy. I, uh, I founded the Load Dynamics operation about a year ago uh, in, in Europe. And um, we, I came here a year ago for the first time, found this event quite useful, and I'm glad to be back here this year. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that we're now part of this new virtual instruments family. I'd like to give you a bit of background on what that means and some of the interesting things that we're doing. Okay. So how, how did this all come about? So Load Dynamics, for, um, for, for some of you who don't know who we are, we were specialists in um, load generation. So historically, we're used by companies and vendors and customers to stress their storage infrastructures to discover bottlenecks, bugs, and problems. So Cisco is a big customer of ours. Cisco found in the region of 30 major bugs in the product that they didn't know about because they were able to use our technology to push and kick and stretch and twist the technology in different directions and reveal issues they didn't know about across different protocols, across NFS and SMB and so on. And so Load Dynamics is quite well known in the, the, the vendor community, but not so well known in the, the, the IT organization community. And in the last sort of 12 months since founding the business here in Europe, we've been, I've become very involved in helping uh, customers evaluate uh, new technologies, you know, converged, hyper-converged, software-defined, virtualized. Um, should I stay or should I go to public, private, hybrid? All these continuous technologies that you've got to evaluate, but which one's right for you? And the answer is, it might be all of them, it might be none of them. You don't know until you try. And that's the role that we've been taking in the market. Now, um, at the same time, we were uh, coming uh, into contact with uh, monitoring tools such as uh, Virtual Instruments, which does root cause analysis, real-time monitoring of your, your storage infrastructure. And customers of Load Dynamics and customers of Virtual Instruments start to say, we really want what you guys both do in one product. So it became kind of logical to unify the two products together. So essentially what we have today, Virtual Instruments, um, this merger that's happened in the last 30 days means that we've now got a single platform that can look over the real-time operation uh, of your SAN. And historically, virtual instruments focused on the block and the SAN side of things. Well, our background is obviously multi-protocol. We support 14 different protocols. So what we bring to the party is broadening out that monitoring capability to all protocols and looking into uh, file block object uh, and, and cloud architectures. So that's really how we've ended up uh, in, in this situation. So I'm going to roll on to some of the more interesting things. So we started out, these were our Load Dynamics customers. All of you have had at some point uh, relationships or used some of these products. And as a consequence of working with these, customer, these vendors, they needed to be able to convince the customers that they were a good fit, that they were fit for purpose. So these manufacturers started to bring load dynamics in to help validate the proposals that, the, that were being made. Okay? So over sort of a 12, 18 month period, we went from a situation where 100% of our revenue came from all the manufacturers to um, starting to have a more balanced, you know, 30, 40, 50% of the revenue was starting to come from the IT organization side of the fence. And we, we find ourselves now in that position. Now, What's fascinating when, when we look at one of the, the inhibitors for us was how do we reach and get access to more customers? Well, the advantage for Load Dynamics and partnering, merging with Virtual Instruments is it gave us access to this install base. So it took, our, uh, it took us an entirely a new position, a new place. So these became new opportunities for us. So I'm not, I'm not going to labor it, but I'm just trying to emphasize um, it's elevated our opportunity and access to a, a much broader uh, part of the market. So this is what we have today um, as a unified strategy. And again, apologies, I've been focused on this new business for 30 days. There's a hell of a lot of things I don't know that you guys probably know more than I do in many cases. So I'll hold my hand up now and say that's the case. But um, when we're looking at the, the proposition on, on the, the left-hand side here, um, the virtual wisdom platform is doing real-time monitoring across the stack. So be able to, to correlate what's going on in the across the application, the server, the HBA, the switch, down into the storage system, and be able to recognize patterns, being able to say, 
I can see something wrong in that switch, which actually corresponds to something that's wrong in the HBA, which corresponds to things that are wrong um, in the virtual machine, for instance. So the correlation's uh, quite important. And so when it comes to finding problems, how do you then reproduce that problem in the lab to, to troubleshoot it really quickly? So this is where um, the load dynamics, lab, uh, load generation technology comes into play because we can essentially take a workload in production, bring it back to the lab in a matter of seconds where you can be reproducing those problems and more easily um, troubleshoot and, and fix them. And because we can do it in that way, you can also share those profiles with all the vendors. Remember, all the vendors are using us in their QA labs. So you can very quickly share the problem that you have in your environment with the manufacturer, meaning they can turn around the problem much faster. And we've got numerous examples of manufacturers who've, we found a bug in the microcode they didn't know about that's causing either downtime or really poor performance. We can get that problematic situation back to the vendor very, very quickly where they can be reproducing it and fixing it so that the downtime is minimized. So it's good to be able to kind of unify these things together and I'll, I'll come back and touch on this in detail later. <coughs> so the, the, the title of this presentation is talking about de-risking transformation. So for me, when you talk about making a change, there's, there's always a risk comes with change. And it's how diligent are you in validating that those changes don't break things. PayPal is a big customer of ours who use us to validate when they make a microcode change, there's no performance impact. Because you can imagine the impact to PayPal if uh, there, there was an issue. So uh, the life cycle for us begins with um, technology evaluation. Very heavily involved right now in helping customers evaluate which technologies are best suited for their workloads. I'm doing a project just now which is quite interesting where we've captured a workload from one of the e-gaming companies, the Grand National event. And we're taking that back to the lab and we're replaying that peak workload against fibre channel and iSCSI over Ethernet to let them evaluate, if I was to move from this platform to that platform, would it stand up at scale? So it's a great example of being able to take that workload and drop it into a completely new environment and see how it plays out. And then we can increase the payload 4x, 10 times, 20 times and find out the point at which that product will fall on its backside at what point will smoke start to come out the back of the device? So it, it's fascinating stuff. Well, it is to me anyway, maybe not to the rest of you. Um, and then the next question is, okay, now I've decided which uh, product I'm going to do a deep dive analysis on. You're going to want to sort of work out, well, you know, what, what is the, the best product option here? There, there might be three different products on offer. Which is the right one for you? You don't really know until you try out your workloads against it. What we do is make that whole process easy. Typically, when a customer goes through a project like this, we're talking 10 days of effort or less in terms of capturing their workload, bringing it back to the lab, playing it out against the different products or configurations that are of interest and coming up with the results. Now, if a customer tries to do that by himself, generally it's a two to three month, ex uh, two to three months exercise. So the next question is, okay, now I've decided I'm buying this product, how much do I need? The golden question. And very often what customers will do is we'll have us say, okay, let's plug in the configuration that the vendor's offering us. Let's play out the workload and then let's reduce it. Let's see what happens. So we find the optimum balance. Do we have enough? Do we have too much? How do you right size for performance? We've, we've helped customers save half a million to a million pounds on individual projects simply by helping them right size. Now, I've been in a situation where I've said to a customer, hey, I can save you half a million pounds by right sizing, and he says, I don't care because I'm used to spending too much money. Okay, strange thing to say. That's half a million quid, that's one workload, but you've got 20 workloads like that. So what if I can do that 20 times? Then do you care? What would you spend that money on? Another innovative project. So then it starts to become a bit more interesting. So the next thing is, okay, now I've decided which product I'm, I'm going to put in place. I now need to keep an eye on it. And this is where the real-time monitoring comes in. And there's lots of products out there in the market that do monitoring from different perspectives. You've got your application performance management tools like AppDynamics and New Relic, tools like that that are great at looking at what's going on in the application and table space. They'll show you badly written SQL queries. They'll show you problems in the, the server. 
The trouble is, once you go beyond the server and you try and say, yeah, but in the infrastructure, that HPA is not performing or it's not balanced or there's a problem in the switch or there's a problem in the storage array, there's a bit of a black hole. And that's where infrastructure performance management comes in. It complements APM. So it's not a question of you need one or the other. You, you kind of need a view into both worlds. And that's the world that virtual instruments with virtual wisdom um, fulfills. And then we get into things like... Um, uh, change management. So, again, as I mentioned, PayPal, when they um, make a change to their environment, like change the microcode, they want to see the impact of that. So that's, that's quite a key one for us. Um, a project we did recently with another customer, was, he was doing an Oracle 11 to Oracle 12 upgrade. There's actually quite big changes between Oracle 11 and Oracle 12. So the question was, what's the right configuration on the storage inside to make sure that we get the performance level benefits we expect from this upgrade. So we're able to capture the Oracle 11 workload and play it out against the storage infrastructure and then um, sh capture in the lab the Oracle 12 uh, profile and then compare the two and look where efficiencies need to be made, if any. Okay? So that's kind of the life cycle for us and, and it goes on and every customer out there will typically have 10 or 15 projects, 20 projects a year where they're continuously evaluating which workloads should go in which technology. So for us, that's, that's the real reason why people keep returning to our uh, solution. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on the case studies just now. What I'd like to do is um, focus on, very quickly, the, the virtual wisdom stuff. So essentially what we're doing is um, correlating what's going on between the application, the server, um, the switch and the array. Um, generating alarms and all this information that's being collected can be viewed in the virtual instruments console or funneled back somewhere else on that higher level authority if that's of interest. The bit that actually, I sat through my, my first real demo of this the other day there and the bit that really got my attention and made me sit up and pay attention was the analytical piece because I come from a storage resource management background and in the SRM business it's up to you to go and look and find things and for, it's up to you to make those decisions. With analytics, it's about it will recognise that something is amiss and come and tell you about it. It will say, I see that usually Tuesday looks like this, but this week something different is happening. And so that the analytics bring to your attention areas of concern. Um, so again, I can talk to you later about that if that's of interest. So what I want to do just now is sort of finish off on the, the, this um, workload modelling methodology that we have. So when we go out and work with customers today, Essentially, the methodology is first we have to acquire your workloads, and that can mean pulling log files from your storage arrays like Unisphere or High Command. If you've got older um, arrays, like I'm working with one customer who's got an EVA array, which is pretty old, there's no block size information in those log files. So we're unable to properly characterize that in a workload. So in a situation where there is no meaningful data in log files, we have real-time workload sensors that will capture the, the footprint, or we can pull it from virtual instruments, okay? So essentially, the first thing is to give you the analytical view of this is what your workload looks like, and then we can hit a button on the console to say generate workload, and it will recreate a synthetic workload based on that actual profile, so you know exactly that what's running in the lab is based on uh, production. And we can replay that out across a whole variety of protocols over fiber channel, NFS, SMB, iSCSI. So again, as you're evaluating all these different technologies, you can take that one workload and throw it against those different scenarios and, and figure out which one's right for you. So the, the thing I want to finish off on is Workload Central. So it's a new community portal that we've uh, just launched. I think Martin, you kindly referenced it recently. This is where it's a, it's a community resource that you can go to, workloadcentral.com. You can upload the log files from your storage arrays, and it will immediately give you an analytical view. It will say, within this, it will recognize there are seven or eight workloads in there. It will say, I recognize this is an Oracle workload, or a SQL workload, or a Sybase workload. Give you those analytics, and then allow you to compare that with other people. And you then have the opportunity to download that workload. So let's imagine you were going to try out Oracle 12. You can go in there and pull down the Oracle 12 workload and try that out in your lab and see if your current infrastructure can cope with that. And this is a free-to-use site. We're not charging for this. I'm getting about five to ten registrations a day at the moment from this because people are fascinated by the analytics. Because most people today don't have a genuinely good grasp of the workloads. 
And if you don't understand your workloads, then how can you possibly put new solutions in place? So um, what I would like to suggest to anyone who's interested in this afterwards, I can give you a bit of a demonstration on the laptop. But yeah, workloadcentral.com is the address. And um, I'm quite excited about this. I think it will create a lot of awareness and bring a lot of people to our door. Um, so I think, are we just about up for time, Nico? Are we? Three minutes, okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's Workload Central. So I suppose the only other thing I was going to give you some examples of um, where people have been using us. I often get called in to solve a specific issue. So working with a customer uh, at the moment who's got some like 20 um, storage devices globally and his challenge is he enabled dedupe on them and performance, on, what a surprise, was impacted but quite seriously. So the question was whether when the next microcode version came along, can they trust it? Because the last time they did it, it had a big effect on their business. So that's when they would bring us in because we were able to generate, uh, recapture that customer's workload and replay it against that new microcode version in the lab. And we can do data reduction ratios of two to one, three to one, four to one, five to one, to show you the point at which your latency goes through the floor but also to verify that that new microcode version will stand up before they deploy it globally on 20 machine, 20 arrays. And so that's a, it's, it's kind of a point use case, but th there are continuously um, projects coming up. As I said, um, I've got another customer in the north who wants to migrate to cloud, and his question is, this workload that is my, I run my business on, could I stick that on Azure? So we can, we can take a workload that's in-house and replay it against Azure, and you can measure the IOPS, the throughput and the latency that you get from sticking it in Azure versus on-premise. We can do the same thing, throw it against uh, Amazon S3. So you can identify which workloads would, would run nicely on S3, would run nicely on Azure, would run nicely on that private cloud supplied by one of the vendors, or maybe some workloads will just never make the grade. You're never going to migrate them, but just, they're, they're too uh, legacy, if you like. One of the things that we also look is back to analyzing, you know, I was talking to Shell recently, and they have 3,000 applications. They say they plan to migrate to the cloud by 2025. And I say 3,000, 5,000 database instances. Really? Surely there's got to be some applications there that won't make the cut. So from a virtual wisdom perspective, it can recognize systems that are no longer being accessed. So rather than the business saying, I need that, you can go in and virtual wisdom and say, I can see that there's been no access or very little access on that system for the last 45 days. You've got empirical evidence to say, we'd be better shutting that down, consolidating it off. There's not enough activity on that to justify keeping it in place. So when people look at that, we, what we want to do is help them categorize which applications should just get decommissioned which applications should be left on premise, which applications should be in a tier one scenario, a tier two scenario. Now you think about the tiering of applications, you can do all that for free with Workload Central. That's quite a powerful entry level to the company. Um, it's a bit of a radical step because you might think you could monetize that, but if you think where we're trying to go with the strategy, it makes a lot of sense uh, you know, to empower this community uh, of people. And this will be used by customers, vendors, integrators, consultancy practices, the more the merrier as far as we are concerned. But in principle, um, I'm just going to wrap things up there and if anyone has any questions, we can grab a coffee and please catch up. And uh, that's it. Just a quick question. Are you running under the name Virtual Instruments going forward? Yeah, so essentially, um, we, we have taken the name Virtual Instruments uh, purely because you saw that install base at the start. It wouldn't make an awful lot of sense to just overnight change that. It's possible that we'll change the name longer term to something else. But for now, it makes sense to stick with that brand that everyone knows and recognizes. But understand it's the Load Dynamics Management team that's running this new company. Top, top down. So it is essentially a Load Dynamics with a virtual instruments name. Any other questions? Yeah, when you say replay workloads, are you talking about an inline box that's capturing the SQL queries to run them again, or are you talking about something like a monitor for dumping all the TCP RP traffic? To yeah, good. It's a good question. It, yeah, a, I should have mentioned that. So essentially, from our perspective, when we talk about a workload, we're talking about the, the, the storage workload characteristics. We're talking about the read-write ratio, the block size, the random sequential mix, 
those characteristics that make up that unique footprint. So, so when you replay that, for instance, if you vary the block size between 4K, we have an iteration test that goes 4, 8, 16, 32K. As you increase the block size, you'll know that performance takes a nosedive unless you load the box with cash, for instance. So it's all about helping you recognize the point at which your workload characteristics will cause it. I mean, I see uh, workloads that are very random, right intensive, big block sizes, crush a lot of all flash arrays. And I see tiered storage products very often doing just as well as, as the flash products. You know, so it's, what I'm saying is there isn't a one size fits all. It's the workload characteristics that drive the value you'll get from the solution. Are those uh, transactions and metrics and so forth done based purely on storage? Or does that account for compute and memory utilization as well? So you get a bigger, kind of more rounded picture? Yeah, so when we talk about, um, from a virtual instruments monitoring perspective, it's, it's, doing, it's monitoring the end-to-end -end piece and the, the metrics that we then import are, can be fed in from that. So essentially, the load dynamics, load generation appliance can be fed its information from that virtual wisdom source. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that we merge so that we have enough breadth and depth in the metrics to do real representative workloads. Um, but from our perspective, we're capturing everything that happens at the storage level, so it's all the storage metrics, because what we're really trying to do with the load generation is test and validate the, sto the underlying storage infrastructure. Yep. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of discussion has been about uh, scaling systems up. Uh, yeah, well, so a lot of discussion has been about scaling systems up. Uh, and not so much about scaling systems down. Mm. Uh, have you been uh, looking into the opportunity of using all the information you gather with the uh, systems like uh, virtual instruments to, re to, give, uh, to give a feedback to running systems so they can scale down, so to optimize, I don't know, when running in the cloud, for example? Yeah, yeah well, so you Absolutely, you know, so you, you, you have the metrics that allow people to make those decisions and whether you choose to do that analysis in the virtual wisdom console or whether you choose to have us feed a third party engine, there's a rest of, there are APIs now in the product that allow us to, to present that data in other interfaces. So absolutely, as I said earlier, we can do things that look at H, uh, switch ports that are underutilized. So you can say, there's been no activity through those switches for ages. We're paying maintenance on those damn things and we're not using them. So some customers use us to reduce maintenance payments on underutilized under, under ports for exactly the reason you mentioned. Yep. I just wondered if you could maybe do with these type of analytics that you've got in there to uh, maybe use the data that you Well, we would provide the met we would provide the metrics to drive that case, and then you'd wrap the business methodology <coughs> around it. But absolutely, without the data, you couldn't do that exercise. We would give you all the metrics to drive that exercise. Yes. Yeah. 